Okay, this is our third and final video in the personality section. We've looked at the psychoanalytic perspectives, the humanistic perspective, and the trait perspective. The psychoanalytic and humanistic basically explain how we develop our personalities. The traits describe personality traits. Okay, so we're going to move on now into the social cognitive theories and exploring the self. Here are the learning objectives, and here we go. So we first of all start out, there was a, a researcher named Albert Bandura who will come up again in our social psych uh, section. Uh, you rem probably remember him from our learning section as well. He was the guy that uh, looked at social learning. And basically he says that our personalities are basically developed from an interaction between our, our personal you know, psychology, the environment, and our behavior. Okay, so with the behavioral approach, they're saying that our personality comes from what we learn. You know, we observe other people doing things and then there are consequences for how we behave, you know, whether they're reinforced or punishment, punished, and then that will determine how we behave as a person. It works along the lines of reciprocal determinism, which look at you know interpersonal factors, environmental factors, and behavior, and how they influence one another. They each have an interaction. Reciprocal means that we have two you know interacting parts. One will dictate how the other acts, and that is what determinism. It will determine kind of your behavior. So in our, this example of the rock climbing, uh, we could look at the in interpersonal factors as being you know thoughts and feelings about risky activities and if we combine that you know with the environmental environmental factors like your friends enjoy rock climbing and that could lead to our behavior of learning how to rock climb and when those all of those influences are together you're probably going to go rock climbing yay there's other ways um, which we interact with our environment. You know, you think about it, you know, different people choose different environments. You choose the schools you go to. You choose the music you listen to. You choose the friends that you want to hang out with. Okay, and those will also dictate the types of things that you're going to do. Those, those environments will dictate your personality or your behavior in those situations. Our personalities also shape how we interpret and react to events. So... Perhaps, you know, we are people that are quick to react to something. So something occurs, we react strongly, which will change how other people will react at that same time. And it, we also create situations to which we want to react to. If we see somebody as an angry person, you know, we may give them unconsciously, we may give them a bit of a, a cold shoulder because we expect them to be angry, which invokes their angry response, which actually creates that anger response. So all of these influence between the environment and yourself are what go together in the social perspective. We look at optimism versus pessimism too. Um, optimism is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be optimistic about situations that can help you through a lot of situations. You know, it's better, you know, during a breakup uh, of somebody you've been dating for a while, you know, to be optimistic about it and say, you know, you're going to feel bad, but, you know, eventually this is going to get better. Um, that I have a say in what's going to happen. Um, however, we can have excessive optimism, which can actually cause problems as well. If we feel too confident in some situations, we're going to get ourselves in some kind of troubles. Uh, for example, when we look at, you know, late teenagers, uh, late adolescent, um, they feel optimistic that they are less likely to contract the HIV virus to get AIDS. But as we get older, we tend to change. But that kind of optimism, because this happens to other people, and I'm optimistic it's not going to, can lead to those kinds of problems. Um, and often, when we look at blindness to one's own incompetence, there's an argument can be made that you have to be competent to recognize competence. Okay, so for example, if you are bad, if you have bad grammar, you may not know you have bad grammar because you don't recognize what's bad grammar. So those people that tend to be a little more, you know, on the less intelligent side, tend to believe things more readily. All of this has led to a Martin Seligman's positive psychology, which is really looking at how can we create an environment or create the, an, uh, an optimal situation for a person to thrive. And psychology in the past has always been about kind of negative things, you know, disorders and people with neurotic problems and those types of things. But the positive psychology looks at how do we create people and communities that 
will help people thrive. And, you know, which leads to the question, what do you think? You know, is it important that we study the positive sides as well as the negative sides? And in, in a lot of cases, I think you would probably agree that positive psychology, which is newer and is quite popular, is a probably a welcome branch of the psychological science. The social cognitive theorists, too, would believe, you know, uh, the inventories and things that we take don't really tell us what, uh, how a person is, is going to behave in a situation because a situation changes so many things. Um, we can go into uh, any kind of situation and our personalities will be obviously different, as you probably know with yourselves. Your personalities are probably entirely different if you play on a team. Your personality is probably different if you're in school. Uh, you may be introverted in class in school, but you know when you're with your friends you become extroverted, so the situation has a lot to do with it. Um, so a lot of them use um, simulations. Actually the military uh, started to do this with spy training and they would put uh, people that they were candidates for their spy missions into actual situations where they had to deal with real you know, problems that they may face along the way, like intense interrogation and things like that, and see how they behave. Because they believe it's probably more predictive someone's past behavior than it is their personality traits or whatever, however else we explain their personality. Businesses will use these simulations too. Managers sometimes in positions will be given, you know, a managerial role in something. As you can see there, Mr. Trump down, I guess President Trump now, down in the bottom left uh, during his apprentice show, which was situations for a, a big long job interview. Um, student teachers, for example, come to your schools and they teach. They are evaluated along the way. And that is a real good indicator of what kind of teacher that they're going to be. So the, putting them in those situations gives a better indication of how they will behave in those situations. The social cognitive theories, they are based on research. We do find that people tend to behave the way they have in the past. However, a criticism is it focuses maybe too much on the situation and kind of removes that inner person out of the equation a little too much. So when we compare the major personality theories, we have psychoanalytic, which is Freud. Okay, and you can go back and look at those things. You can look at this chart. Um, I'll probably copy this chart for you so you can have it. And there are a few others coming up that I, I will do so. But just to remember, you know, the psychoanalytic was the first one with Freud. The psychodynamic with Adler, Horney, and Jung. Humanistic was Rogers and Maslow. And the trait, we have Alport, Isaac, McRae and Costa. Um, we didn't talk about McCray and Costa that much, or at all actually in the videos I think, so it's worthwhile to have a look at that in your textbook. And the social cognitive again is Albert Bandura. When we look at the research methods that are used, case studies, if you remember way back from our research unit where we look at one person individually in depth, is really used in the psychoanalytic method and it's used in the humanistic method. The survey, which we use questioning, is we would use in the, tra the trait theories, the social cognitive and positive psychology. Projective tests is psychodynamic. Remember that was like the, the thematic aperception test and the Rorschach ink block test. Um, trait psychologists will use inventories such as the MMPI, which was the most um, well-tested, most uh, very accepted thing was actually an uh, instrument that was used really to identify um, nervous disorders. Uh, however, it's used for many other things now. And of course, our big five. The social cognitive people will use observation. They will observe people in situations and they will observe perhaps in a, in a mock situation as the apprentice or the military training. Okay, and experimentation would be used in the social cognitive. And this is, of course, where we, we, we look at the variables and we manipulate variables. In all of the other uh, forms of research, we don't manipulate any of the variables. Remember, the research design is really important for you to know. There's almost always questions about it on the AP exam. So when we look and we explore the self, and the self is really, you know, who are we? And where does it come from? What is our actual sense of who we are? In fact, biologists have even looked at that and they've actually found a region in the, in the central frontal lobes which seems to be active when we ask questions 
of a person uh, that would relate to, you know, what they are, who they are. And what we also find, too, is we tend to have a bit of a spotlight effect. If you can remember back in, in development, we talked a little bit about the um, idea of the imaginary audience. This is kind of the same thing. We think that people notice us more than they do. That, you know, if our hair is, looks funny, I know I don't have any hair. But people don't notice as much as we think they do. Uh, there was one study done in a class where they made students wear t-shirts and actually they had Barry Manilow on it, which even back when they did that research, Barry Manilow wasn't considered to be really cool. And they thought most of the students would notice and say something. Uh, however, only about 20% of students noticed the t-shirts. The so people aren't paying as much attention to you as you think they might be. So self-esteem, you know, that, that feeling uh, the, of being good uh, is also kind of an important aspect of a person. So self-esteem is how we view ourselves. The self-efficacy is a term actually came from Bandura. And self-efficacy is how we rate ourselves as far as competency to complete something or to do something. So, for example, in an English class, uh, your teacher says you're going to be writing an essay. Some students go, right on, I'm really good at essays. That's an example of, of a high self-efficacy, where other students go, oh my God, that's horrible. I don't, I'm not good at these. This isn't going to work out. That's low self-efficacy. Our self-serving bias is we tend to take more responsibility for the good things that we do than for the bad. Um, when we do well in a class, we pat ourselves on the back and say, I really worked hard, I deserve that grade, or I'm really smart. And when we do poorly on something, we blame it on, oh, well, I had all these other influences going on, you know, I had, um, I was busy all the time, or, you know, things were going wrong for me. And we will tend to attribute it to things that aren't ourselves. But if it's a good thing, it's us. You know, when your team that you have, uh, or your favorite team you're watching is winning, we look at that as, wow, the team played really well. However, when we lose, we start to look at, you know, other explanations. You know, the refereeing wasn't any good and so on. Um, and most people tend to see themselves better than average. Okay, so it's kind of a defensive self-esteem. Some of this leads into narcissism, which is thinking that we are much more important than we are and feeling good about ourselves. And we look, you know, online on social sites and we um, look at texts and tweets and web pages that people have put up and it gives us an idea of what those people are thinking. And we're seeing more and more on Facebook, for example, people posting, you know, a lot of selfies and stuff and we can almost identify who the narcissists are. In fact, we can get a really good idea of someone's personality from what they put on a web page. You know, in some cases, maybe somebody pretending to be somebody they're not, but almost always it actually reflects somehow their personality. Which leads us to, you know, the culture in all of this. We come from individualistic cultures here in North America where doing the best we can is important. So if you can imagine an individualist that we move into a collectivist culture, we're going to still maintain our sense of self and we'll probably get along. We're still going to be that same person and we can probably do it. Uh, we believe we can do it. We have more freedom to move around and to be successful in these other environments. Collectivists, not that they're not going to be successful if they move into an individual, individualistic society, but they more identify with the groups that they're in. So now when they're removed from family and friends and their social groups, um, they're going to lose a bit of their sense of self when they come into that situation. Uh, one is not necessarily better than the other. However, it's just different cultural influences that can have on someone's personality and their sense of self. Here's a chart just comparing uh, the values contrast between individualism and collectivism. And we look at aspects as the self, you know, independent and individualistic, interdependent and collectivist are the life tasks, what matters, coping methods, morality, relationships, and attributing behavior. 
um, individualistic culture. I'll just mention this, but I will give you this chart as well. Um, behavior reflects one's personality and attitudes. So it, that's like in our culture. Our behavior, you know, if we have a bad attitude, it re reflects our personality. In the collectivist cultures, though, it's behavior reflects the social norms and the roles. Uh, teenagers are a lot less likely to engage in behaviors that will embarrass their family and their friends. Uh, whereas in North America, we may engage in that and we know it's just us we have to blame and it's us that's punished for it. Okay, so we have different personalities based on the culture and a different sense of self. And that is the end of our personality unit. We will do some reinforcement stuff in class and we will see you folks then. Bye for now.